So welcome everyone. For the benefit of the recording, this is workshop number 413, Adaptive Leadership for Tricky Challenges. I'm the Reverend Renee Rahutsky, and this is my colleague, the Reverend David Pyle. We're both Central East Regional staff, um, part of your UUA staff. So thank you for coming and choosing this workshop. I'm going to leave that um, first slide up for just a moment. You can uh, use your smartphone to click on the QR code, and you'll be able to download the slides. And at the end of the workshop, I'll go back to this slide so you can do that. And then they'll also show up on the UUA website in um, probably within the week. And we're also video recording this workshop, and that should be on the UUA website if, the, if it turns out probably late August. So I'll give folks a second to grab that. Good afternoon. Yeah, I'll let, let, let David talk. <laughs> so good afternoon, everybody. How was your GA so far? So, so some of you know that when I do, when we do workshops, we sometimes wander around a little bit. Uh, we've set it up so we can do that, but we have to stay up here on the stage. So, just to say, but it's good to see you all, and I'm glad you're here. And again, I'll come back to this slide at the end of the at the end of the workshop. So um, our little secret is this is kind of a preview to one of the courses that we offer on the UU Institute, our online leadership school. We have uh, little business size cards on the table with more information about that. You can see, um, go to our website. There's also a few pens left. There's also pens and more of those little cards at the Congregational Life booth on the UUA Expressway in the exhibit hall. So, so how many of you have heard of the UU Institute? Oh, we've got some people who haven't. Awesome. How many people have taken classes of those of you who have done it? Okay, a couple. A couple more, yep. Oh, great. So a mission field, right? <laughs> this is great. Thank you. So... To begin with, one of the things that I have had several of my congregations that I've served do was to read this very long book. Boards have done it for me because they like me, but not because they really wanted to do it. It's called Adaptive Leadership. It's out of the Center for Adaptive Leadership at Harvard. Um, Ron Heifetz is the most commonly named author, but there are a few others. And I named this book, we bring it up, because this book is not written for congregations. Adaptive leadership was written for organizations across many different lines. It works, it's been very popular in some businesses, it's been in corporate, the corporate world, it's been very popular in the nonprofit world. But the lessons that we're drawing out of this come from the work of this team out of Harvard. And so it is written kind of as a handbook, so you could get one copy for your congregation and just stroll through it, you know, go to the chapters that seem to make sense. But we're going to try and give you with this and with the UULI course the main points that are helpful in congregations. So in essence, we've sought to distill out of this larger volume of knowledge what are the points that are most applicable for congregational life. Oh, I jumped a little bit. So I'm going to start off with one of the most fundamental aspects of adaptive leadership. And this is understanding the difference between adaptive challenges and technical problems, or adaptive and technical challenges. So hang with me for a minute, because I've got a great story to help you all understand this. But I want to give you a little bit of a framework first. So a technical problem is a problem where the problem can be clearly defined. OK, hang with me. The solution is known. Somebody, maybe not you, but somebody knows how to fix whatever that problem is somewhere. The knowledge exists. And if you apply that knowledge effectively, the problem is resolved. An expert solver, and an expert we mean it could be a technical problem that all of us in this room are experts on. We're going to have one of those in a minute. All right? So get, we're naming this as a technical problem. 
The next one is what we would call a mixed problem. And in a mixed problem, the solution is fairly clear. The problem is clearly defined. You can see it. You can look at what the problem is and understand its dynamics fairly easily. The solution, however, may not be known. The solution may be harder to define. You can see what the problem is. Hang with me, I got an example. You can see what the problem is, but the solution may not be known. And the solver may take some expert knowledge and a group of people adapting that expert knowledge to a specific set of circumstances. Last one. I went backwards again. Not my clicker. Um, the adaptive problem is where the, the actual definition of the problem is really unclear often rooted in relationships because of how unclear human relationships can be. The solution is unknown because to reach a solution, those relationships have to adapt. The relationships between human beings have to change. And the solver is really the community itself. The people who are involved in those relationships have together solve the problem. So, here we go with my fun story. So I'm going to assume in this moment that all of you have some connection to a Unitarian Universalist congregation. Is that a safe assumption? It's GA with interfaith, but it, this works for almost any church. You come, who goes to church on Sunday morning? Not all of us, but let's say on this day you do. You get up on Sunday morning and you're the first person going in. You're unlocking the building, right? And you go in on that Sunday morning and none of the lights are working. Worship is going to happen. This is a problem. There's no electricity. So you go to the person who comes in behind you, which is one of the building people. All churches have building people, right? We know who, how many building people are in the room? We know who we are, right? So you go into the building people and you say, the lights are off. And they say, aha, I know how to fix that. And so they then go to the fuse box. And they flip the fuse on the fuse box and the lights come back on. This is a technical problem. A problem where there is a clear understanding of what the problem is. There is knowledge that exists. You may not have it. You may not be the building person. But there is knowledge that exists that lets you, someone apply that knowledge, and when the knowledge is applied properly, the problem is resolved. You get with me on this one? All right. Same situation. You come in on Sunday morning. You go, you see the lights are off. You go to the building person. The building person says, aha, must be the fuse box. Goes to the fuse box, all the fuses are fine. The building person goes, huh, this may be beyond my level of knowledge. So the building person quickly calls the contractor who is in the congregation, who's on their way in, who is a electrician or knows an electrician. And you bring in the electrician and you survive the Sunday morning service without power because we can do that. But you bring the electrician in and the electrician replaces the fuse box or fixes something technical in the lines and the power is now back on for next week. Once again, a expert, even if you didn't have the knowledge and even if the knowledge didn't exist in your system, an expert can apply knowledge that exists and the problem is resolved. Last one. You come into the church on Sunday morning and the lights don't work. You can begin to tell the story with me, right? The lights don't work. So you go and you say, ha, huh, building person. And they say, ah, oh, it must be the fuse box. And they go to the fuse box and the fuse box is fine. And they call the electrician friend and the electrician friend comes and says, actually, there's nothing wrong with your system, but did you notice that the power is cut off at the street? And you go, what? And so you then look and you find out that no one has paid the electrical bill in three months. You then start looking a little deeper and you start talking to people who are supposed to pay the electrical bill and you find out that there is a dispute happening 
between the treasurer and the church secretary about who gets control of the church checkbook, and somebody has taken the church checkbook home and hidden it. Now this is what we would call an adaptive problem. The core problem is not that the power is off. That is a symptom. You also find out that that adaptive problem, that the power being off, is not the only result here because no bill has been paid for three months. Now, there are some technical pieces that have to get resolved, right? Somebody has to find the checkbook and write some checks. We know how, I hope, I'm going to ask this question, do we know how to write checks? Is that knowledge we have in the room? Will writing the checks solve the core problem? What will be needed is the adaptation of human relationships. And that is hard. That is difficult. That is messy. So somebody share with me some ideas of what could be an adaptive challenge in your congregations. So go ahead, I'll repeat it. Okay, the PA system. Tell me why that would feel like an adaptive challenge to you. Some people can't hear, okay. So I'm going to bring this one out a little bit because it depends on why the PA system is a problem. If the problem is the PA system just isn't working right, but there would be the resources to correct it, then this could be a technical problem because there are experts who know how to design PA systems that you could access that if they applied that knowledge and some resources, the problem could be fixed. If, however, the problem with the PA system is that there is someone running the PA system who really isn't that good at it, and no one wants to, you know, talk with them about that they're not that good at it because, you know, they try really hard. There's good feelings about them. We want to affirm them. And so we're willing to accept that the PA system is not functioning, or some people have been. Once again, you see, that's rooted in relationship. Do you get what I'm saying? Who's got another idea of an, of an adaptive? So how about this? How about um, you're on a nominating committee, and... Uh, your church has decided that the nominating committee is going to come up with names for who's going to be on the board next year. And you have congregants who say, well, we'd rather have an election process where we bring several people up for each uh, position. And the nominating committee says, no, we don't think we want to do that because we don't want intra-congregational uh, uh, con uh, confusion and upsetness. We'd rather do something where right. you, you pick it up uh, where we, we select. And then there's the other side says, no, that's not transparent. Would that be a good example? That, that's a great adaptive problem. Because rooted in that are several things. One, all right, so the problem he said was you have a nominating committee. And the nominating committee is charged by the bylaws to name candidates for a, for a board position. But there is a movement in the congregation outside of the nominating committee who wants there to be multiple candidates named for every position. The nominating committee believes that that would, I'm going to assume, would be unduly disruptive to congregational life. And also, in most of our congregations, finding one candidate for board positions <laughs> is sometimes enough of an adaptive challenge. So, am, am I on? Yeah. So, so naming that you have a dispute that no technical fix is going to solve because the dispute is rooted in human relationship. The challenge, the problem is rooted in human relationship. Let's see if, thank you. Let's see if we got one more. That's right, right there. Okay, so the old carpet that was in the sanctuary needs to be replaced, and the group that was charged with it chose the wrong color. So I think that is certain. This is what I would call a mixed problem, right? So it has some adaptive elements, and one of the adaptive elements I would pull out of that is the group that was charged with making the choice 
appears not to have really been charged with the decision, really empowered to make the decision, right? So there is an adaptive problem in that they were told they had a level of authority that the congregation actually wasn't granting to them, right? That's one aspect. Another aspect to pull out is um, that there, there are technical aspects to this because you could replace the carpet again did you have enough resources, time. and So there is some things that you could do, but really this is about, in most congregations, how much did it cost to replace carpet? A lot, yeah. So, so, that, so you see that there are technical pieces to it, but really this is about having a conversation within the congregation about empowerment, about how, what authority means within the congregation, and that is a shifting of human relationships. Are you grasping the concept? Because I could go with this all day, but Renee would run me off the, off the stage. So... So one of the other challenges of this, and this is one that we run into, is, is the hero myth of leadership. The idea that leadership in congregations is done along the lines of the one person who will be out front and everyone else will follow. That leadership is solitarily managed. Lots of people get bought, buy in to this hero myth of leadership this idea that we, the problem is, is that most human communities, especially Unitarian Universalist human communities, have one of two dynamics happen. Either A, everyone wants to be the hero leader, or B, no one is ever allowed to even come close to being the hero leader. But we have this image built in our culture that we have someone who is one person or one group that is leading, and yet an expectation in our tradition that we are much more consensus-based, that we are much more in leadership of our congregations and our movement together. Is this an adaptive challenge for all of us? Because it's rooted in the sense of human relationship. So. Learning leadership comes, leadership really comes in three different forms. And we've put them here in kind of a slide order of hierarchy. That's kind of a value judgment we're making, but we're, we're sharing this with you. The first is the authority-based leadership. Authority-based leadership is based upon authority inherent to someone or to a position based upon their place in the human order of the community. So one, this manifests in two different ways. Usually it's referred to as formal power and informal power. Formal power for authority-based leadership is I have a role in the congregation and because I formally have that role, I'm in charge. Now some of you know that I'm an Army Reserve Chaplain. I've spent 16 years now in the United States Army. This is the model of leadership in the United States Army. It's based upon your role. Informally, authority-based leadership is based upon informal power, such as, I've been in the congregation 30 years. Or, I'm the major donor. Or, I am the loudest person in the congregational meeting. You see, but all of these are based upon positional authority. The next type of leadership we often have. So relation-based leadership was the kind of leadership that I had when I was a moderator of my home congregation. It's the kind of leadership where, hey, David, you know, I enjoyed dinner, having dinner at your house the other night. Would you like to be the treasurer? <laughs> right? So it's our... <laughs> But it's, it's, it's out of our relationship that I can do the ask. And actually, this kind of re leadership often shows up when we're doing stewardship, right? We want to have that kind of relation-based leadership. We're in relationship. We're in covenant with one another. And so we, our stewardship le style of leadership is often this kind of leadership, rather than you should give or else. So how many people does that sound like a familiar ideal, right? 
This is actually where much of Unitarian Universalism wants to be or claims we want to be, even though we often will fall back, especially in times of crisis and challenge, we will fall back into the positions of authority-based leadership. Because relationship-based leadership takes a higher level of energy outlay. It takes a higher level of work. It took her having to have dinner with me. And that's kind of terrible. I wouldn't want to wish that on anybody. But it takes you building that community relationship. And this is where a lot of our congregations aspire to be. We want to name one more. Maybe. There we go. And that is adaptive leadership. Adaptive leadership takes some of the aspects of authority-based leadership and some of the aspects of relationship-based leadership and moves them into working towards large systemic adaptations of the congregational system. So instead of the goal being in relationship-based leadership, find somebody to be the treasurer, in adaptive leadership, the goal you're working towards is why is it it is so hard to find somebody to be the treasurer? You still got to find somebody to be the treasurer or decide that a treasurer is actually not necessary. Anybody believe that in the room? If you do, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. Um, <laughs> it'd be great. No, if, and I, I am of the thought that at times, if you have a leadership role you can't fill, that may be t- the system may be telling you something. But adaptive leadership is really about shifting your focus away from the short-term gain of solving what the immediate problem is to asking the larger questions of why that problem exists. Why is it so hard to bring people into leadership roles? The clicker, there we go. So, adaptive leadership challenges. Did I click one too far? Okay. There are challenges for which there are no simple, painless solutions. Problems that require us to learn new ways. So challenges which there are no simple painless solutions, problems which require us to learn new ways. So adaptive leadership challenges are making progress on these problems demands not just someone who provides answers from on high, but changes our attitudes, behavior, and values. To meet challenges such as these, we need a different idea of leadership and a new social contract that promotes our adaptive capacities rather than inappropriate expectations of authority. So the best thing I want you to think of around adaptive leadership is that it is a style of leadership that is constantly asking the question, not how do I solve this problem, but what is it in our system that creates the problem? under the theory that if you can get at the root adaptations from which the problem arises, the solutions to the problem will come of themselves. Is is this landing? Are you getting it? So, um, we are often, adaptive leadership is hard work. It takes a lot of focus, it takes a lot of energy, it takes longer times, and it is messy. And so looking towards the deeper solutions, especially in lives of congregations where leadership can be more difficult to find and where leadership can take more and more time, is sometimes daunting. The point I wanted to point to this is that we, there is an attraction for us to simpler forms of leadership. And that attraction leaves us in not because it, is, it can seem easier in the short term, but over the long term, not addressing the systemic problems of a congregational system lead to longer emotional and spiritual and leadership outlay over a longer period of time. So the attractions of protection, direction, and order leading to a form of power and trust. You wanna add a piece to this? 
I mean, I think we see this right now with, you know, the rise of the populist movements like the Brexit vote that just happened in Great Britain and the rise of Donald Trump, where Trump is promising to make America great again. And people are willing to give him power and to trust him with the leadership because he's promising protection from immigrants, direction toward a different kind of America where there's economic um, opportunities for everyone and order. You know, the, the, we're going to make sure that, you know, the social order is put back to where it is. So there's a group of people who are comfortable with that, that authoritative uh, way of being a leader. And the last thing I want to say is that group of people, this tendency to want to give um, priority to, to that protection, direction, and order is actually rooted deeply in humanity. And it's something that even us can be drawn back to in times of chaos, crisis, and challenge. That the larger the problem is that you're facing, the more likely the desire for, dire for di protection, direction, and order will, will come up even in the most progressive, liberal, and shared ministry of congregations. I say this just so you know it when you see it. Amen? All right. So adaptive challenges are always messy. They don't have clear answers. Why? I said it earlier. They're rooted in human relationships. And human relationships are complex because human beings are complex. So adaptive challenges are always messy. They never see that you have really clear answers or solutions and authoritative leadership styles don't work to solve adaptive challenges. That you can't order your way or protect your way into the solution of an adaptive challenge. There was no way to order the treasurer and the secretary to bring back the checkbook because it had become a thing between them. And for someone to bring it back was for someone to admit in a conflicted environment that they were wrong. And that is very hard. So adaptive learning is a model proposed by Ronald Heifetz in his book, Leadership Without Easy Answers, and developed further in leadership of the line. This is a principle-based model to apply to very complex situations. It is the leadership challenges are complex. There is no one right answer. Real risk must be balanced against reward. So the amount of effort, the amount of challenge, the amount of time and attention you put into solving an adaptive challenge must also be balanced against how much is that particular effort going to affect the congregational system for positive health and gain. Because you can put a ton of effort into an adaptive challenge that is not going to have a great effect. And if you do that a couple times, you don't have a lot of effort left. So there is discernment to make sure to know what it is you're working towards and know how that will transition the congregational system. The leader does not impose a solution. The final solution emerges from the dialogue of all the parties. This is really hard for us sometimes, especially in times of cri crisis, chaos, and disorder, when we really have a natural desire to want to say this is how it's going to be because the crisis, chaos, and disorder is so uncomfortable. Now, who has ever been in a congregational conflict that was really, really uncomfortable for you. I'm going to tell you why. I believe congregational conflicts become so uncomfortable because we invite people, in Unitarian Universalism in particular, we invite people to come into religious community with their deepest selves to invest their hearts and souls, and then we have nothing we make them agree on. We don't have a doctrine or a dogma. So we rest in that discomfort, I think, even more than some other traditions. 
So really learning to be in that discomfort in a spiritual way, learning to hold each other in those times, learning to not impose the solution as a way to solve the discomfort, but bring the congregation together to work through over a period of time a dialogue and discernment about what is the way forward, that is to me the spiritual practice of Unitarian Universalist congregational life. And lastly... All parties learn from one another and learn more about the solution, the situation in, in the process. So all parties, the intention for, for we're making adaptive leadership work is that it is not solution focused. We come back to what I said at the beginning. It is focused on identifying there is a problem and then trying to deeply understand what the problem is, what the challenge is looking for the deepest roots of that challenge you can find on the belief that the deeper you understand the, to the adaptive challenge, the clearer the solution between you will come. All right? So this is a wonderful graph. And believe it or not, this is a graph of one part of how the human brain works. And we're going to talk about this as a, a way that the human brain adapts to anxiety. So I call this, you have an area, think, first before we talk about community, I want you to think about yourself. Think about your own, who's ever, who has ever been anxious in this room? <laughs> Some people say you want to be a non-anxious presence, I don't believe that, I think the only non-anxious presence is the dead person. I think we struggle to be less anxious presences at a particular moment. But human beings have a level of anxiety. When anxiety is so low, we have no motivation to do anything. Who has ever had massive changes in their life when everything was perfect? There's a couple people where you chose to make major changes to who you are, and there was, but for most of us, change comes out of times where our anxiety has risen. So the bottom end of that line, where the yellow starts, is where anxiety is low enough in the person that there is no real motivation to change, to adapt. The top end of that line, the red section, is the area of anxiety where the anxiety has risen so high that the prefrontal cortex of your brain turns off and you're no longer rationally functioning. We know this. Right? Who has ever been had someone that started saying they got very anxious or very angry and started saying things to you that you know they did not mean? Who has ever done that? That is the moment when the prefrontal cortex has turned off and you're in that reactive, self-protective, fight-flight-freeze mode where literally the part of the brain that operates the slowest, which is the thinking part of the brain, turns off so the faster part of the brain can take over and get you out of danger. So in this, we know that the place where human beings are the most creative, the place where we have the most ability to transform and change ourselves and the world and our communities, is when the anxiety is high enough we have a motivation for change, and low enough that our, pre, that our prefrontal cortexes of our brain have not turned off. And that zone is known as productive distress, or also called the creative zone of disequilibrium, which I think is the best phrase ever. So it's in that space where we, in the space that's blue, that we as human beings make the most adaptive change and where congregations make the most adaptive change. Uh, there's a couple people in this room that have had me as an interim minister, right? And they realized after a little while that I would at times turn the temperature up, that I would at times raise the anxiety in the congregation. There was a particular incident involving birthday Sunday in one congregation that's in this room. That, that I would intentionally raise the anxiety. Why? Because if the anxiety was too low, there was not enough motivation for change. And to also keep your hand on that dial to do your best to prevent the anxiety from going up the top end and moving out of the space of being able to make adaptations. Can you all sense this in your own lives? 
Does this kind of, as it happens for us, it happens for our communities. It happens for our congregations. Now, the one other thing I'm going to point out here is, oh, what did I just do? Fix it, please. Thank you. There we go. Is, is this the light? This is the light. There's no light. Okay. So you see the part there where you have the, the problem that comes out. It gets too hot in the line. It moves up into the red. And then it comes down, and it has to drop all the way back down into the yellow. Who's been in a congregation where the anxiety has gone too high for the congregation to function well? You can't easily move right back into that time of creativity after that happens. But the, we, we really need to let the anxiety come back all the way down into the less anxious zone to be able to move back up into creativity. But most times, doing adaptive work, your goal is to keep the congregation in that zone of productive distress. Now, at times, when anxiety is too... The, the zone of productive distress can change over time. There are times when a congregation's zone of productive distress can be really wide, and you could do a lot of stuff. There are also times where it can be really narrow. And part of the work of doing adaptive leadership in a congregation is being able to discern how much capacity for adaptive change your congregation has at any one moment. And sometimes the times of the most crisis, chaos, and disorder are the times when there is the least capacity to do adaptive change. And I would argue that small congregations, like 40 members and other under, have a really narrow um, area of productive distrust, unless there's some event that's happened for them. So it's, you, can, you can do adaptive change in smaller communities, but you have to really regulate because you don't have a lot of um, latitude for that kind of adaptive learning. So I want to share, quickly share five of the big ideas in adaptive leadership. Um, how many of you have taken adaptive leadership course at General Assembly before? I know we've offered this. Um, this is probably stuff that you've heard before, but I want to move to the, the pieces that haven't been shared before. So I'm going to kind of go through this quickly, but again, you'll have access to the slides. So the first um, big idea is to create powerful questions. Powerful questions are questions that elicit curiosity, that ask people to lean into whatever the, the challenge is. And um, the thing about powerful questions is they have a certain architecture to them. Uh, first of all, there's the construction of the powerful questions. They're, they use words like why, how, what, who. Um, I'm sorry, why, how, or what. You don't really use questions that start with who, or where, or when. And you certainly don't use yes or no questions. You want questions that really invite curiosity, that don't have an obvious as answer. Um, you also want to be careful about the scope of your powerful question. What's the context? Are you just talking about your own congregation? Or maybe just a group within your congregation? Are you talking about the congregation as a whole? Or maybe you're thinking about your congregation and the greater community. So for example, um, there's a lot of workshops out there talking about the changing nature of religion in America. That um, there's a lot of people who check none of the above when they um, are asked what religion they are. And doing church in that kind of context, um, we have to kind of understand that. And that might actually be embedded in a powerful question that you might come up with for your congregation. So for example, I'm going to use a case study around growth. But for example, if your congregation is declining, you have to really pay attention to what's going on in your community and the wider dem demographics. If you have fewer babies in your nursery, you have to remember, well, the birth rate's fallen, right? And then finally, um, what assumptions are embedded in your powerful questions? Sometimes you ask a question that includes blame. Why don't those young people come to the Sunday morning service, right? Or it might have um, 
imply the, the some sort of conflict that's going on in your congregation? Why can't the humanists and the Christians get along? And also just what the paradigm is. You know, why this, again, you know, why don't those young people want to come on Sunday morning? Well, maybe the paradigm's changing. So you have to think about the powerful questions you really want to take into account all these bits. So here are a few sample uh, powerful questions. So how do we want people in our community to feel when they encounter the fruits of our congregation's work? What might our adult faith development program look like if we took seriously our commitment to encourage spiritual growth? If someone offered us $3 million for our building to to buy it from us, how might we reimagine our ministry? So the second uh, concept in adaptive leadership is this idea of getting on the balcony. And I've I've, um, been using adaptive leadership for a long time, just in my own work. And I use this so often, I have to remember that not everyone knows what it means. But it's really this idea of uh, imagine yourself at a, a, a ballroom, at a dance, Um, Maybe some of you were there last night with me cutting the rug, right? So imagine you're at a dance and you're on the dance floor and you can see who's dancing around you. There were, you know, a couple of um, youth who just bridged who were dancing next to me and um, there was a gentleman in a wheelchair. We were actually dancing together. And I knew there was a DJ somewhere, but I really couldn't see, you know, where the DJ was, but there were flashy lights, so I think it was kind of over there. So getting on the balcony means that I could actually walk up some stairs and look over what's happening. And so there I could see the DJ, and I could see the people that I was with. But I can also see there's a group of wallflowers over in the corner, and I can see that there's a couple that seem to be having an argument over there. And so it's really being able to get the big picture of what's going on. And so... um, We often do this in our congregations already by creating things like long-range planning committees. Um, Our board is really kind of tasked with being on the balcony of our congregation. Our committees on shared ministry are supposed to be on the balcony and think about how are we doing uh, with our ministry as a whole, not like why isn't the religious educator bringing more children in, but, you know, how might we serve our communities through our children's religious education program? So it's really having that big picture view. So one of the tools I like to use when I'm getting on the balcony is this idea of distinguishing observations, interpretations, and judgments. And I love this comic. It says... um, there's a sign that says, uh, whippersnappers are welcomed, and two old guys are standing there saying, there, that ought to dispel the myth that we're all elderly, uh, that we're an elderly congregation that doesn't know how to reach out to young people. Right? So the observation is there are no young people in their congregation. Their interpretation is they're not welcoming enough, and their judgment is because they just, you know, They think that they can have a technical fix, that it's easily done by just putting a nice welcoming sign out there. And so I actually do, I teach middle school in my home congregation. I actually use this with my middle schoolers. You know, what's your observation? What's your interpretation of your observation? And what's your judgment? So you see someone like my colleague David walk into the room. Your, an observation might be, wow, he's got a military haircut and he, he walks with a certain gait, right? My interpretation might be he's military. Actually, he has a short haircut. That's the observation. Yeah, this is long. Actually, it's grown out. Yeah, I, I, I Skyped with him a couple of weeks ago, and it was, it was pretty short. So my interpretation might be he's military. My interpretation might be he's a gun nut, right? And then my, my judgment might be he doesn't belong here. He doesn't look like us. Does that make sense? And if you all don't think here. I haven't experienced that in our congregations... The look, on your, the look on faces of congregations when I say, actually, I'm on the UUA staff. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, I actually think I wrote a blog post that I shared some examples of interpretations and judgments. But this is a tool that you can use to sort of get on the balcony. What, you know, what's, what's really happening? How are we interpreting it? And, 
Actually, I always say, just put the judgments aside because they really don't have, you know, you want to be able to parse those or separate those from what your interpretations are. So um, the next concept is work avoidance. And I've got the Mad Hatter's Tea Party here because they're always moving to the next seat rather than to, to clean up what they've done. But work avoidance can show up a lot of different ways in our congregations. It's um, referring something to committee over and over again or tabling something. That's one way it shows up. Um, it can also be let's create a committee for it to make, to make that happen, but there's nobody really passionate enough to, to actually serve on that committee. Yeah. One of the great, uh, the great phrases that lead often to work avoidance in our congregations is, I think we need more data. That's a good one. So another bigger example in our, in our greater community is that global warming really is going to require an adaptive challenge. And everybody driving Priuses is not going to do it, right? Even though we feel good when we buy a, a fuel-efficient car. But really, we're going to have to, like, take mass, mass transit and, you know, really rethink, you know, do more. I mean, we do more webinars. We've been doing, um, being adaptive in that way. But um, it's tempting to define the challenge as a technical problem. And that's, that's a, oh, a kind of work avoidance. It's also um, tempting to change the problem to fit your expertise um, I tend to do that. If you come up and talk to me at the Congregational Life booth, I'm like, oh, we've got the UU Leadership Institute, and we offer a class in that, right? So it's really tempting, you know, when you, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But it's really tempting, you know, with, if you have a stewardship problem, well, we'll just go back to um, visiting every member of the congregation because that worked two or three years ago. You know, if that's not working anymore, then you have to really find a different tool than a hammer. And also, um, sometimes you can make the problem too big to solve. It's a, it's a work avoidance. Actually, this is also a derailing in a, a congregational meeting. Sometimes somebody will derail something that's, um, like some uh, proposal that's being put forth. Someone will come in and say, well, if we do that, the budget will be messed up and we won't be able to do this. So it's, it's making the problem so big that everybody shuts down. So that's another way of um, the way work avoidance shows up. Collect more data, yep. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> reorganize, that's another one, right? We're not doing good ministry, so let's, let's change our governance. Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it's work avoidance. And of course, blaming those in leadership. Or creating a proxy fight, right? So if sometimes if um, people are unhappy with a staff member a certain part of their performance, they'll actually create another problem, like all of a sudden there's a budget shortfall, rather than really working exactly um, with the person directly about what the problem might actually be. So the next concept in adaptive leadership is creating holding environments. And so in some ways we have the ultimate holding environment, which is our covenants. If we agree to stay at the table together, to work toward the same transcendent value and how our mission is embodying that value, that is actually a, a great holding environment. But there's other things like cottage meetings and other opportunities for people to have input and to think about it and to really try on, you know, whatever the changes or whatever the, um, the interventions might be as you're trying to, to work with an adaptive challenge. Define that. So, well, I have a I have a uh, pressure cooker there, where you can regulate the temperature and the pressure of what's going on in there. And so, in our human relationships, because well, adaptive challenges are all about changing relationships, we find ways to create holding environments for our relationships. So, there's, for example, um, has anybody heard of restorative justice circles? So that's a, if there's a conflict in your congregation, creating a restorative justice circle is a holding environment where people can come in, have a safe space that's structured in a way that the, the ick that's happening in your community can be um, processed so that you can get beyond it. 
So one of the easiest ways congregations can create a holding environment in many different settings is to have a meeting about the adaptive challenge where you say at the beginning, there will not be a solution decided at this meeting. We are going to come in and it will be uncomfortable, it may be uncomfortable, but we're going to come in and be together and let this problem rest amongst us. And so really, there's lots of different forms that holding environments can take. Um, I've seen wonderful, uh, wonderful con both congregations and Zen groups use uh, council circles with talking sticks as a way to just be present to the problem as a community and allow then people to not let go of we're going to find a solution, we're going to fix the problem by saying no solution will come out of this meeting, we're just going to be present to it. Does that help you grasp it? Thank you. So I want to, we've, we've been, this is really juicy stuff and it's really hard to do in a 75 minute workshop, but I want to share a little, uh, a way of using this, um, these ideas in a case study. Yes. Oh, the fifth one is, uh, da -da. oh, the productive disequilibrium. So it's, it's back to that chart that David explained earlier. And again, that's the, the turning up the heat and regulating the heat. So, you know, if things get too hot to cool things down and the holding environments help us. The holding environments are designed to keep us in that blue learning zone. So let me just be honest, I jumped the slide. So um, I'm, a, I'm a visual learner. And so what I did is I created a visual map of what this might look like. So this might work for some of your brains. It might not work for others of your brains, and that's okay. Um, reading the, this is really going through the book and some of the trainings that I've had, but I, di I created a visual map. So if it doesn't work for you, don't despair. There's other ways of taking in this information. And in the, the cor in the course that I teach, you actually work your own case study, either using this map or kind of a, a series of reflection questions. But this, this worked for my brain. So when you have an adaptive challenge, you want to you want to get on the balcony, kind of, and you want to think about it in an objective sort of way. And for our congregations, I really recommend that you always start start with your mission. Why are we here? Who are we? And so, um, in my case study, the the moral owner is the mission, which is connect with one another, grow in our personal selves and in our congregation, and serve. We want to serve the greater community in some sort of way. And then you also sort of want to have your goal. It's like, where do we want to be heading? You know, there's some sort of adaptive cha um, challenge, but what do we want to, it to look like on the other side? And so... Um, it's really important to frame your goal the same way you frame your powerful question, what do we want it to look like? So for my growth goal, and I'm, I'm, I'm using growth because I know a lot of congregations are struggling with growth. Um, this could be, you know, how can we be more multicultural? So a goal might look like we want to grow and increase um, Unitarian Universalists, so we can change the world, so that all people can flourish. So we want, we, you know, we want a, a, a community, a worldwide community, a beloved community where every single life has, has meaning and is cherished, right? And that's been a big conversation this week about Black Lives Matter and stuff, yes? So this is an adaptive goal rather than a strategic planning goal. So in doing this, you would set goals that, that describe that goal, but this is sort of the overarching vision goal, if that makes sense, for an adaptive challenge. And this is, this is a way that the leaders are, I, I must, this is in the context of a group of leaders sitting down and sort of parsing out, trying to figure out what the challenge is. But we know that we want to be a religious community that has impact in the world. And we do that through growing our membership and growing ourselves personally. So it's kind of a more of a visionary goal than a specific goal. So what's the context? I talked about that. What's the setting or situation that we're trying to grow? 
And so um, in this particular case study congregation, uh, they had a charismatic minister back in the 1970s, but recently they've been declining in pledges and in members. The membership's aging, as is the leadership, and there's been some clickishness, some conflict, and low energy in the congregation. Does that sound familiar to any of your congregations a little bit? Not so many, though. That's good. I like to see that. So then you think about who are the stakeholders and what are their interests. And so when I talk about stakeholders, these are people who um, can even be an ancestor. They are people who have power and authority in your system. And there are also people who are affected by your system, people who are affected by your institution. So you think about your different stakeholder groups. What's their relationship to the adaptive challenge that's going on? So if we grow, what's going to happen to them? If we decline, what's going to happen to them? What's the preferred outcome of each of these groups? We have people in our congregations who say they don't want to grow, right? I like the congregation the way it is, and I don't want it to change. We also have people who say, boy, I want to be a member of this congregation, but I feel shut out, and I really would like to be, you know, part of, feel like I belong here. Well, we'll talk a little, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about that. So this is an example of how you might think about that. So an important thing when you're thinking about stakeholders, because it's really tempting to just say, well, they're cranky, but what are their noblest values? What lies underneath how they feel that well? why they feel that way. So example, you know, I want to feel like this is my church. I don't want this church to change, and I find myself on the outside of it. Or my noblest value might be my loyalty to this group of friends that were together when we founded this church 50 years ago. So there's different noble values, but it's really important, important to understand what those underlying values are when you're thinking about your stakeholders. You also need to know where their loyalties are. Again, quite often with, I, I mean, again, I'm thinking of some of our small congregations that grew up in the fellowship movement. Their loyalties might be to each other more so than the mission statement that your congregation adopted two or three years ago. And it's important to know that. And finally, you know, to identify what the potential losses might be for the, all these stakeholders. And I, I referred to that a little bit earlier. So in this case study, our stakeholders are the people who yearn for the glory days, back when that charismatic minister was still serving the congregation. We also have stakeholders who are our families in RE who feel like there's a big barrier between the RE wing and the sanctuary. There's also existing leaders who are tired but don't trust the newer members to step into leadership. And there's also future possible UUs in your, congr in your community who maybe have walked through your doors and felt like there was a barrier to them coming in. Does that, does that make sense? So the next thing I want to think about is the formal and informal authority. And the thing about adaptive leadership we alluded to earlier, but... We really, it's a really key part of it, is that the scope of authority that you have as, an elite, as a leader, and I'm, I'm uh, sketching this out uh, as you as a leader trying to intervene in a system that has an adaptive challenge. You have your authority. You might have some relational authority. You might have some you know, actual positional authority, being a minister or a congregational president or just you know, someone who's been with the congregation for 40 years. But you actually, for an adaptive challenge, you actually have to increase your informal authority. So an adaptive leader is hopefully someone who has integrity and reputation in the system, so there's a level of trust. But you're also going to be, dis you know you're going to be disappointing people. People are always looking for that answer, the right answer. They might be looking to you for that right answer. And the thing about adaptive challenges is you have to actually uh, try different things and make mistakes as you're trying them. And 
part of your informal authority is actually sharing the authority in some ways where you invite people in to like this is an experiment we don't really know what to do you know the the pledge drive you know instead of blaming the stewardship chair when the pledge drive fails you know we as a community have to rethink how we do stewardship we may even have to rethink what membership means in this congregation and that's a, that's a, that becomes identity for our folks right what does it mean to be a member of your congregation so if you start having those kinds of conversations you're kind of stepping into the unknown and you're you're putting a little bit of pressure on your relationships with others in the congregation So in this case um there is actually a shadow board in this con- this uh case study congregation. This is not a single congregation. This is an amalgamation. So don't try to think, "Ooh, who is she talking about?" You know, this this happens in a lot of different congregations. But in this particular congregation, there's a shadow board that talks about and and vetoes the decisions. This might be a group of people who have dinner together and talk about board stuff. It might be, you know, there's the parking lot committee that you sometimes hear about, but there's another center of authority so sometimes in this particular system um there might be a minister that's close to retirement and there's a little bit of a lame duck thing going on where they people don't want to people are waiting for the next minister to to come along and not so much this minister um and there may be a cohort of new members who think differently um there might be a, if you have a group of older members who've been around around, uh, around for a while that are in leadership perhaps there's a, a group of gen x or millennial members who have leadership positions at their jobs and get together and say wow you know this is really messed up what can we do and that might be a new center of leadership and authority in your congregation because if they have a few successes people will start trusting them more Um the other thing to do is just look at some of these other uh concepts that showed up like work avoidance. Where is work avoidance showing showing up in your congregation? Is there some resistance to updating the mission and vision? You know, we really don't want to have a direction because then I won't really be able to use my over-talking in meetings to get my way. Um maybe there's some resistance to new sh- stewardship ideas. Um you might have a social justice committee that's had the same members for 30 years and each one of them has their pet projects and there's resistance to doing maybe a group wide social justice project that in- includes children and so on. So the other another piece so this is really complicated right this is why I sort of drew, drew it out in this a uh, mental map. There's also competing commitments in your congregation that can interfere with interventions around your adaptive challenge. So for example, um if you had past leaders during the glory days and you need to do things differently, it might feel like you're insulting those past leaders by changing the way they do things. And we see this with little things, right? Gladys has always done the rummage sale like this so nobody can change it and don't buy rectangular sticky tags when you we all, we've always used the round ones. You know, there's those kinds of things that we don't want to hurt someone's feelings so we don't try something new. So that's a competing commitment because we care about Gladys and we love her and we don't want to hurt her feelings. Um another competing com- competing commitment might be the reluctance to talk about money. and that's going to interfere with um really having honest conversations about stewardship. You might have a um view of membership where real members serve on board committees and people who are doing the ministry of the congregation aren't really giving cr- giving credit for volunteering as well. And I've seen this in a lot of congregations that like none of those new people are serving on the board or serving on the committees, but they are teaching in religious education and they might be worship associates but they don't get credit for that right um and finally just think about what are some of the uncertainties there's a lot of unknowns and adaptive challenges for example um is church going out of style right we've talked about that a little bit will we lose members if we change let's see and finally um I always find it's helpful to find metaphors that frame the problem just because it activates a different part of the brain. You know, I've been talking about uh examples and and um describing the situation, but sometimes it's just helpful to have a metaphor cuz it helps you look at something in a different sort of way. So, for um in this particular 
a case study, let's make our church garden an organic one. So there's this idea of the or- organic in that, you know, we want things to be able to sprout up kind of naturally, um, that different kinds of things might be able to bloom than what we've just been growing. So how are we doing on time? Uh. So does, it, does this make sense? So how many, how many of you are resonating with this visual map? I just want to do a check-in. Uh, about a third of you. Okay. Um, I'm going to brief. So th- this is sort of the framing of the problem that I'm, I've done here. So there's a second map. This is where it gets complicated. This is why we do it over a semester instead of in 75 minutes. So when you design the intervention, that's when you come up with your powerful question which we talked about a little bit earlier. And so in this particular congregation, how can we invite and help people to grow their souls and serve one another while building the beloved community? So there's this idea of growing the personal soul, serving, and the big idea of we we want to have a beloved community in the world. So that's kind of the, you know, what might it look like on the other side. So that refers back to that goal that I had earlier. It's not a specific goal. It's more of an overarching kind of goal. And so this is not the best powerful question that you could come up with for this, but um, it's close enough. Let's see. So the second thing is, the slides keep moving. The second thing is to find out where you're going to create your balcony space. How are you going to be able to look at your own, own system kind of from this, this overall view? And two of the things we recommend is using group spiritual discernment. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a method. We have a, a class on that, actually, that Phil Lund teaches. But it's really sitting together with the problem and just creating a space for people to think about it differently or to um, open up their imaginations. Kind of like sitting in Quaker meeting is a way of describing it. And then another place that you create balcony space is encouraging team learning. So encouraging teams to maybe do a study on um, the situation maybe that other congregations are in that's similar to yours and how they've done it and how that might work with your congregation. But not have one or two people do it. Actually have a group of people do it. And invite people who are kind of at the margins of your congregation. There was an article in the New York Times by David Brooks that, <laughs> that um, talked about sometimes the, the people who are not quite the insiders, They're, they aren't really immersed in the system, but they're at the edge of the inside, have sort of this different sort of view, and they can bring a lot of clarity and fresh thinking into what's going on. So team learning that includes those people as well as the people who've been leaders and involved for years and years. So the other, another adaptive leadership um, intervention is thinking whose work is it? So um, I knew of a, this is a different congregation, but I had a congregation who was not able to afford full-time ministry. They had a full-time minister, and they decided to hire a half-time interim minister. But they had that half-time interim minister th- preach three Sundays a month and do a little bit of pastoral care. And everything else was done by the lay leadership. So I met with them and I said, well, how does the congregation know that you have half-time ministry? Why would they give more money? Because they see somebody in the pulpit three times a month. People are being visited in the hospital. You know, who's carrying the anxiety about being, being paying, only paying for half-time ministry? And, of course, the board and the committee chairs were, right? So the work of the people is the, the people really need to feel the anxiety of only being able to afford half-time ministry. And so um, they decided, okay, we're going to actually have the minister only here two, maybe two, I think it was maybe three Sundays every two months or something, and then bump up the, what the minister was doing um, on the administrative side of things so that the board leaders would you know, be supported rather than them carrying the, the burden of, of that part of the church. So sometimes it's the core leaders, um, Sometimes it's the, the former or the members who've been around for a long time. 
And sometimes it's just the membership in general. So in this case, you really want the people on Sunday mornings, okay, we have lay-led services, because of course they couldn't afford guest speakers to come in. You know, what would it be like to have awesome worship more than just twice a month? So the other thing is to look for partners. Um, as, a, as an adaptive leader, you can't do it by yourself. You have to have a team of folks that works together, uh, looking at the problem and devising ways for people in, the con- in your congregation to also participate in figuring out how to address the problem. Um, and you've, you, most of you have done this. When you do vision, mission work, you, know, you, invite, you create opportunities for uh, cottage meetings and world cafes and things like that. Is that. Are those words resonating with you a little bit? So there's, there's ways to invite people into the conversation. And then you start thinking about interventions. What can we do in our system to, you know, what we call them high-impact, high low-risk interventions. So these are things that you can't change everything at once necessarily, um, but you can change something significant to learn if, is this, if we change in this area, will it have a, the effect that we want on our congregation? Um, Low risk means you don't want to have half your congregation leave when you do something, right? That's, that's high risk. But low risk, um, anyway, the, the, the big thing is you want to choose things that you're going to learn a lot from that particular intervention. And so in this case, um, you might, for the, the deepening spiritual growth, you might move to a theme-based, uh, a theme-based Sunday service for a year or something, like to uh, encourage more spiritual depth. Um, you might renew a small group ministry program to help connect people and build trust among the newer people and the, the people who've been around for a long time. And then the other thing is creating these holding environments. What might those look like as you're making these changes? So one holding environment is actually just saying, we're going to try it for six months. And then if we hate it, we'll go back. Um, that's one way of lowering the anxiety. You know, Joys and concerns, this is a, a very, you know, that's a, a, an adaptive challenge. You know, we want to share our lives with one another. And if we're going to change how we do that, that really um, distresses, quite often distresses a lot of our members. So doing something where you just try it for six months is a way of at least trying it on, where it's not like it's going to be like this forever. And finally, another uh, way of creating a hold, holding environment is recasting the story connecting to parts of your own church history where going in this direction makes sense. It doesn't feel like you're doing a complete 180. See. And again, metaphors for framing the work. And so for the intervention, I was thinking of um, moving from organic gardening to permaculture. So how can we create a culture in our congregation that is renewable, that... um, that we don't have to tend necessarily and has a lot of good organic stuff in it so that everybody's fed when they plant themselves here. So do you want to add anything? Or? I'm good. Good, okay. So, well, let me just add this, the tiny little piece to say, we said before, this is us walking through in 75 minutes what we would do in an entire semester to help you all to walk through an adaptive challenge as your case study in your congregation. So this is overwhelming, right? It's a lot of stuff. What I want you all to take this as is you just got the brochure. And if there are challenges in your congregation that you think having a systemic way to understand it, to engage it, to bring people around it, to deeply create the necessary interventions, you as a leader can come and participate in the, U, in the Leadership Institute, in, in the UU Institute, and walk with us, with your own consultants, walking through that, through the program, to be able to do that within your congregation. It feels daunting until you do it. And once you do it, it becomes second nature. Amen? Amen. Although we're all still learning it, it's, it's, it's just a way of being in the world, to think of, think of things differently. Whose work is it is really helpful. So we have a time for some few questions. Please come up to the mic if you would. Questions, comments? So what's the name of the course that I want to take? <laughs> Leading Adaptively, 401, I think. 
You can buy the book too. I mean, the book the book is great. It's just it's it's big and it's complicated. Uh, the, the practice the practice of adaptive leadership. And I did promise I'd go back up to the um, the slide deck card. We. Are there prerequisites to taking this course? Do you have to good take question. Leader 101 or something else? Yes, good question. I do want you to take some sort of version of healthy congregation systems thinking. We have a healthy leadership 101. Those in the South, you might have taken smart church. But this is a systems thinking kind of thing. Everything's interconnected and interrelated. And the adaptive leadership is a a mindset to help you use your system's understanding to be strategic about leading change. Is there anyone in the room who has taken healthy congregations? Anyone who has taken smart church? Keep your hands up. Anyone who has taken a, a healthy leadership course? Anyone who has taken a Bowen's family systems theory course somehow? So some kind of system, anyone who has led a generation to generation by Owen Friedman? So any, any of those many different kinds of systems theory thinking can meet the need that we're talking about, right? Absolutely. Uh, this, this is just a, a comment. One of the, probably the best leader I ever worked for used a sort of fake holding environment to introduce change when most people wanted it and a few people didn't. And she always, she would say, you, you start it as a pilot. A pilot. We're gonna pilot this. And it's such a success that nobody ever comes back and says, wait, that was a pilot. When are we going to end it? There you go. Amen. That's a Amen. example of a holding environment. You know, we also, uh, Meg Riley, who's the head of the uh, Church of the Larger Fellowship, says it's always in beta. And really, when you're doing adaptive leadership, you're always in beta. You're always tweaking and adjusting and, and so on. Yes, sir. I have a couple, uh, more than one question. One is... Uh, could you possibly look through this and pick out things that seem to maybe be the larger gaps in what, you know, what strengths you have? Secondly, uh, could you just cover a little bit about uh, what some of the pitfalls that you maybe, you know, become familiar with, with doing this? Because I'm having a hard time imagining uh, we have a small congregation with a fairly disengaged board and other people with large amounts of informal power and how, seeing how would that possibly work. So pitfalls. And so the, I think the one pitfall is every leader has to focus on their own functioning. And so the leaders who are doing this kind of adaptive leadership, you have to really have your own leadership center and know where you stand before you can lead others. And you don't have to be the president to lead. You can lead from behind. You can lead from, you know, beside. But, and, and again, the healthy leadership, smart church. Yeah, thank you. So, so in answer to your first question, there is leading through an adaptive challenge. And there is using adaptive practices in your leadership. And I think the first one comes. Being able to begin, if a board can begin to ask the question, how do we think about this from the balcony? If you begin to use adapt powerful questions, that begins you down the process of being able to see the problem broader. So the question that I would say for you for a smaller congregation, um, first step is taking yourself, at, stopping in the moment in a board meeting when you're looking for that solution and saying, how can we see what the broader problem is or the deeper problem? That would be the first thing that I would give to you, and this feels so big. Does that give you something? Yes. Thank you. So one question, and then it will be available. We have to get, um, make space for the ne next workshop. But um, one question, and then you'll be free to go. Okay, so my, my question is um, about these classes, the, the UU Institute. Who offers them? Are they online? Are they available to anybody? Is this a UUA program? Is this offered through your, your region? All of those kinds of things. What, what is the container? It feels like it's just floating out here um, as a possibility. Come talk to me at the Congregational Life booth. I'll be there after I leave here. But basically, they're available to everyone. They're $30 per course. They're online, um, time, they're by semester. They start like every two weeks. The next section opens up. But the materials are available 24-7.
And I would say the container is the Central East region of the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. Um, it is really a, a, a Central East regional program that is within the container of the UUA. It is not limited, however, to Central East regional congregations. Does that kind of get to that? If you want to, I think you were asking who is the authorizing authority, right? And that is the Unitarian Universal, the Central East region of the UUA. Well, thank you all for your time and attention, and hopefully we'll see you again.